thank you. Our research takes place primarily at the Boston VA Medical Center, but we do also do the brain imaging at BU School of Medicine. Uh, the V-Light Company in Toronto currently funds most of our research, and we have had funds from Thorophoto Medicine. We have no financial conflict of interest to declare. There are these four areas that I will be going through very rapidly today. Uh, the first area is with traumatic brain injury, and we work with closed head mild TBI cases where loss of consciousness is less than 30 minutes, and it is the most common type of TBI. These cases, 30% still have cognitive dysfunction, however, six and 10 months or more later. Our first paper was published in 2014 and in the Journal of Neurotrauma, and we had 11 uh, TBI cases. They were treated with red and near infrared LED cluster heads, and the cluster heads were 500 milliwatts in power, and they received 13 joules per cm square per placement. I want to show you how uh, our graphs are set up. These are our results, which were very encouraging. Um, this is the Stroop test for executive function inhibition switching. And the um, standard deviation units are over here on the y-axis. And we did pretest all of our cases. Uh, and as a group, they were minus one standard deviation from the 50th percentile. Then we treated Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week for six weeks. And then we stopped treatment. And one week later, we post-tested them, and they were almost as a group up to the 50th percentile. And they continued to improve at one month and two months later. So it's as if the brain got organized uh, after these photons were delivered to it um, for these six weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, it was also significant for trial three inhibition and also in the California verbal learning test. Four of these cases did have PTSD, and they all improved in their PTSD symptomatology. They were very happy for that. Uh, at the Boston VA Medical Center, of course, we have many cases with PTSD. And this is a 53-year-old woman who experienced 30 to 50 IED, improvised explosive device blast TBIs. And she came in with a pretty high score for PTSD. Over 50 um, is military uh, uh, criterion for PTSD symptomatology. Then she was treated Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six weeks, and you can see that she had reduction of at least 10 points on her PTSD score, and she was much improved. She was very happy about that. Uh, there are other labs and offices doing this as well. This is a paper published by Hipskin and Company uh, in uh, 2019. And they used um, near infrared and red LEDs around the head and on top. They also did brain spec scans before treatment. And this is a patient who showed very low uh, cerebral blood flow before the treatment with the LEDs, but post treatment, there's much smaller areas that have still the low blood flow. Yet there was improvement in cognition. Also, Linda Chow, who's located at the San Francisco VA Medical Center in UC San Francisco, recently published a paper with a concussion case who was treated with LED cluster heads, uh, diodes, um, and we'll talk about the devices used in, in a few minutes. Uh, and she was also Able, he, this patient was an ice hockey player, professional ice hockey. He was only 23 years old. And she did study functional connectivity on MRI scans. And it was very scattered and widespread in the beginning before the treatments. And then after the treatments, the salience network in particular got reorganized and he did improve in cognition. Area two I'm talking about today is retired football players who are suspected of developing chronic traumatic encephalopathy or C. CTE. This is a progressive neurodegenerative disease, and it is associated with repetitive head impacts in athletes, particularly football players or ice hockey players. And there are these deposits, the abnormal protein deposits that appear in, around the uh, vessels and in deep sulcal depths, and it's called phosphorylated tau, P tau. And you can see in the beginning, in, by the way, you can only diagnose this post-mortem, uh, you have these um, 
phosphorylated tau deposits. And then as it progresses, there's more and more of them. Their behavioral symptoms are very disturbing, and that includes emotional outbursts, depression, memory, and executive function problems. You can see in stage one, it's basically dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, brainstem, locus ceruleus. But then these expand, and you get this phosphorylated tau all over the brain, and it's very, very sad, and they just get worse and worse. Now, about five years ago, it was discovered that the brain, the human brain, has its own lymphatics drainage system, its own lymphatics vessels, but they're very tiny. They're about a millimeter in diameter, and they're located within the dura mater, but you can imagine that if there's repetitive impacts coming in, this is a coronal section through the frontal lobes, you can imagine that these very fragile, uh, tiny um, lymphatics vessels could be damaged, and that could be a problem for those with CTE as well. Our first football player was 65 when he entered our study. He was treated with um, the LED cluster heads we'd use with the TBI cases three times a week for six weeks, and we applied 26 joules per cm square per placement. The whole head was treated. When he first came into our study, um, this is severity of PTSD here in terms of symptomatology. He's scored 58. And remember, uh, military is greater than 50, and civilian would be greater than 36. So he came in with a hot, lot of symptomatology for PTSD. Then we treated Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six weeks. And when he was tested one week after that 18th treatment, his PTSD was greatly reduced by about 30 points. And then one month, maybe coming back in two months, definitely not good. And it was the same pattern we viewed for the depression. It was perfectly reduced after the first treatment series then started back. And the same thing was observed for the executive function on the stroop. It was very good at one week, but then it fell off by two months. He did have resting state functional connectivity MRI scans. And this is what they looked like in terms of the correlation matrices uh, pre any LED treatment. This is the right hemisphere regions of interest with the left hemisphere regions of interest. You can see the very low correlations probably not communicating well at all. Then one week after the 18th LED treatment, you're seeing higher correlations coming in, in the reds and oranges. And even one month after the 18th treatment, they're still uh, coming in with higher correlations. However, three months later, the blue correlations, are, the low correlations are coming back in. And that's really basically the pattern you saw with the fall off here at two months later. So this patient is going to treat himself at home and he's going to treat with an LED device designed to deliver near infrared photons only over the five cortical node areas of the default mode network. The default mode network has very important midline nodes. And um, these include the mesial prefrontal cortex here. And then that should be in very good communication, functional connectivity with a posterior midline node, the precunus, and then deeper the posterior cingulate cortex. So this device, the Vila Neuro um, Gamma, is going to treat uh, the mesial prefrontal cortex and the precunus at the same time, because we want to try to get them communicating again. In normal people, they are communicating very well with low frequency oscillations that are really coherent between the two areas. And in normal people, when they're sleeping, these are very active. And even in the daytime, if you're daydreaming, they're very active and coordinated. However, if you want to bring up executive function and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the central executive executive network, these two areas in the midline must downregulate, sort of get out of the way, so that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can function for problem solving, multitasking, etc. Well, you can imagine that in traumatic brain injury, or even repetitive impacts, that the um, these impacts are first going to hit if they're coming in, the, in from the front to the mesial prefrontal cortex. So this creates a problem. 
And then another part of the default mode network we really want to treat is the hippocampus and is very deep in the brain. So we need to use a near infrared intranasal device that we hypothesize will deliver the photons to the olfactory bulbs located on orbitofrontal cortex. And those olfactory bulbs will have good communication with the uh, parahippocampal gyre series and hippocampus, very important for memory as well. So the default mode network is dysregulated in many central nervous system disorders, including autism. And so this uh, football player is now going to go home and he's going to treat three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 20 minutes for 12 weeks. And there's one more thing I want to say about this uh, VLA gamma device he's going to use. These diodes are pulsed at 40 pulses per second. 40 hertz. That's because in a study done at MIT with Alzheimer's engineered mice, they observed that the 40 hertz blinking light shown only to the eyes of the mouse was enough to act activate the microglia to increase the phagocytosis effect to reduce and get rid of many of the abnormal protein deposits. They found a 60% reduction in amyloid beta and 40% reduction in tau in visual cortex. Of course, the light had only been shown to the eyes of the mouse. Um, they didn't use red or nerve for red light. Uh, the football player also wanted to use red wavelengths and he, he got an, an intranasal, which is red, because red, ring, red, red wavelengths have been observed to increase melatonin. These are his results with the two series. Uh, following in the first series, the whole head was treated, good reduction from PTSD symptoms, but it came back two months later. So now he's treating at home, only the default mode network nodes. And after 12 weeks of that, PTSD is gone, is reduced again. He's very happy. He's been treating now at home in Los Angeles for two years. We saw the same pattern for the depression, it was bad in the beginning, then started to come back. And then he treated home for the 12 weeks and it was reduced. This is the McGill pain that was reduced, et cetera. He also had improvement in executive function on trial three inhibition, and he improved by two standard deviations after 12 weeks of treatment at home compared to the pre-treatment. And he had fewer false, a lower false alarm rate under the continuous performance test after he was treated at home and improvement in visual spatial memory. A second football ca player came and he was treated again three times a week for six weeks with a helmet. And this helmet is lined with LED cluster heads that have red and near infrared diodes in them. And there's a midline a row and we can treat the um, mesial prefrontal cortex and the precuneus of the default mode network. And we can treat the left and si right sides of the head, but there was no intranasal that was used. Uh, post this patient uh, did extremely well, the second football player as well, as particularly in reducing his PTSD scores and symptomatology at one week and one month, at which time he said, thank you very much. I'm going home now. I'm not coming back for more treatment, uh, more, more testing. I want to treat myself at home. Uh, with, uh, you know, the NeuroGamma device is what he wanted to use. Okay, if he wants to get it, that's fine. Um, and he said right there, I never want to be the way I was when I first came in. And he was not in great shape when he first came in, I must say. Um, and he had reduced depression as well. And the main thing for him, which was so dramatic, was he was his pain scores were so reduced that he discontinued two of the narcotics medications he was on uh, when he was uh, with us. So... He, I wanted to give you an idea of the severity of his pain score when he came in. Pre-LED on a VAS pain score, it was seven out of 10. This is related to his 15 surgeries during the time he played for the National Football League. And then at one week after the LED treatment series, it was only three. And at one month, it was 5.5. But then he was off of his narcotics medications and he wanted to go off and uh, on his own uh, purchase the Zenite NeuroGamma device, which he did do, and he's done very well. You can look in the literature and you can see that the default mode network is dysregulated in chronic pain and opioid addiction. So we probably uh, treated that um, uh, default mode network as well when we treated with the helmet, at least the midline structures and left and right angular 
gyrus, supramarginal gyrus. So he had improvement in neuropsychological functioning as well in the California Verbal Learning Test to standard deviations above where it was when he came into the study. And he also improved uh, significantly in selective attention on the continuous performance test. He had a great reduction in tinnitus. This is something we had not really expected, but there is a paper published from Japan in 2018 showing that you can deliver near infrared photons to the sides of the neck and that uh, they are then going to be treating the stele ganglion. There can be improvement in even severe tinnitus. This is before average scores on the tinnitus handicap inventory, 78, and after three months of treatment, 4.4. We looked at our photographs and we can see that with this Thor helmet, we're actually delivering uh, red photons to the sides of the neck and you can't see the near infrared, but they must be delivered there too. Uh, in summary, we've worked with four football players and they uh, together have a significant reduction in PTSD and in depression and in McGill pain scores and improved sleep. Area three, I'm going through very quickly, is dementia. And this is a study published by Anita Saltmarsh in 2017. She worked with five dementia cases in Toronto and they received the following protocol. Uh, every day for 12 weeks, they used a separate near infrared intranasal device. Uh, it was pulsed at 10 hertz and it was put in the nose for 25 minutes every day for 12 weeks. Once a week, they came into her clinic and she did the default mode network with them. Now they had very dramatic improvement at 12 weeks uh, on this mini mental state exam, uh, P less than 0.03. But then when you withdraw all of the equipment, no treatment, their scores plummeted. So we do think that people with progressive neurodegenerative disease need continued photobiomodulation treatments. She has a second test as well, the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale for cognition. And on this test, lower numbers indicate better cognition. And you can see there was significant reduction in those numbers, but that equals improvement after 12 weeks. Then you withdraw the treatment and they start to regress. So they should benefit more from home treatments. Uh, in fact, Linda Chow located the San Francisco VA Medical Center and the uh, UC San Francisco uh, did a study she just published in 2019 with four dementia cases who were treated with this home treatment device, the NeuroGamma uh, on the default mode network pulsed at 40 Hertz. Now her results were very encouraging. She so showed here for the photobiomodulation group on this blue line, that they did improve on Alzheimer's disease assessment scale where lower numbers are better. Uh, however, in the usual care group, they actually just got worse. And she does have resting state functional connectivity MRI scans on them. And she observed increased functional connectivity, particularly between the posterior cingulate and this uh, intraparietal sulcus area, the angular gyrus, supramarginal gyrus area. We also have studied uh, a progressive disease uh, called primary progressive aphasia. And that's associated with low, um, actually it's, it's atrophy in the left temporal lobe. And with this type of uh, PPA case, logopenic uh, variant, it's probably beta amyloid deposits and it will eventually take over the whole brain. Um, in the, in the, before any LED treatments, uh, she's in the MRI scanner trying to name pictures and there's no activation in her left temporal lobe. After 18 of the LED treatments, now we get some activation in her left temporal lobe. Now at this time, uh, she has sentence level auditory comprehension for commands improvement, a significant improvement. That's two weeks has the uh, 18th treatment, but that all falls off. And you can see there's no activation here at one month and two months in her left temporal lobe following that 18th treatment. So she would be a good candidate for the home treatments. Last category is chronic left hemisphere stroke patients with aphasia or language problems. Here's the patient in the scanner um, trying to name pictures before he gets any uh, treatments. Now, he is 18 years post left hemisphere stroke. You can see it's quite the stroke. And we 
originally in this protocol, I treated both sides of the head because we thought, oh, it's good for traumatic brain injury. Maybe it's good for stroke too. It's not. Uh, you can see here on his uh, naming scores that he actually got worse. And by the way, the right supplementary motor and left supplementary motor areas were both treated as well. And that is what you see with people who stutter. And that's really not going to help somebody improve their speech. We have a similar... Um, uh, pattern here for another patient who got worse uh, when we treated both sides of the head. Now, the next thing is we have to fix this. So we're going to put our LED placements only ipsy lesional on the left side where the stroke occurred. And that's going to be very effective to improve naming. And you can see right here, suddenly we're just treating the left hemisphere and we're getting this beautiful new activation on the left. And we get significant improvement in naming. And that was true for the second patient too. So we reversed our mistakes from over here. And the issue is, I want you to remember, please, that when we treat stroke patients, we only put the LEDs on the left side if it's this left hemisphere stroke, same side as where the stroke occurred. It's not the same as a TBI, possible CTE, or dementia where we put the LEDs on both sides. Now, this is some correlation matrices, resting state functional connectivity MRI for two of our good response aphasia cases where they were treated on the left hemisphere, side, same side as stroke, plus two midline nodes of the default mode network, mesial, prefrontal, and precuneus. And here you can see this pre any LED treatments, the left mesial prefrontal cortex has very low correlations with left precuneus. And after we do 18 treatments, one month later, you can see we have high correlations again. That was a similar pattern for what we observed with another aphasia case. And you can see these are uh, moderate poor response cases where the uh, LEDs were on the left hemisphere. We, we treated only one midline node of the default mode network and only 13 joules per cm square. And there wasn't as much of a dramatic change at all. This is an example of a good response aphasia patient. And you can see there's no functional connectivity between mesial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate or precuneus pre any LED treatments. And then post the left, uh, post our um, left hemisphere and two midline nodes, our optimal language treatment, now we do have good functional connectivity. And he improved significantly in naming on two of our naming tests there. And he also improved in his ability to use different verbs to describe a picture. So um, when they're stroked, please only treat the left side or the right side, wherever the stroke occurred, but only one side, but do the mesial uh, prefrontal cortex and precuneus for default mode network. Um, this is uh, some functional connectivity MRI for those who are young males with autism. And you can see that the mesial prefrontal cortex is not really well connected to the uh, posterior cingulate cortex. But in typical development, young males, it's very well connected. So um, I'm thinking that you might want to try using our optimal language protocol. And do you to use, use that with children with language problems, including those with autism spectrum, and treat the following. Left side language areas plus two midline nodes of the default mode network. They're all listed out here, and they're in a, this hand up that's on my um, uh, profile there for this conference. And Anita Saltmarsh is going to talk about a new device that's on the market called Cognilum LED cap device, Cognilum LED uh, by Jalika Light from New York. And that cap is expandable and can be put on the head for children or adults. And it treats all the areas that are listed in this protocol here at the same time. It's all going to be treated simultaneous. And these are my wonderful co-investigators and collaborators in Boston. And I wanted to conclude that I do think that LED home treatments are going to be the way to go. And I really would like to see people try the language protocol uh, with autism spectrum cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marnie. That was amazing. Um, I do have some questions and would like to uh, pose those now before we move on to our uh, next presentation. And uh, the first one is about side effects. And in your experience with treatment, have you seen any negative consequences of treatment during your research? 
No, we haven't seen any negative consequences at all. The patients are uniformly very happy and grateful. And that's why many of them want to go off and do it themselves. Right. I know you have experience also, so you can also talk about that. Okay, no, no, and that's great. So I guess related to that, they were wondering about whether any paradoxical results um, had been seen. So although, um, and I, I think that really is more related to some of our experiences, uh, maybe when, not when we've treated, but other uh, individuals have, and they've used large amounts of energy and the whole Arndt Schultz principle of, you know, uh, too much energy and do we have side effects from that potentially? Um, I was thinking I could share my screen with you on some of this because uh, oh, we good. actually do have, I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah, I can um, actually. Perfect. Oh, okay. Uh, we do have experience. Um, well, we don't, but there's a paper published in stroke. Um, okay. A couple of papers were published in stroke. Um, and let's see if I can bring that up, where they had a lot of money, lucky them, and they had a large clinical trial. Can you see this slide? Yes, okay. we can. All right. Yeah. And they, uh, it was very early on, and, and good for them for showing that the uh, photobiomodulation is very safe. But they ended, they, their protocol, because they went right from rats, a rat brain, to human brains, Okay, yeah. you can treat the whole brain in a rat, but don't do that in a human stroke patient. You only want to treat one side. But they were treating the left. You know, these are all the placements where they put the very, rather yes. high power. And then they uh, failed in their uh, phase three clinical trial, although they did have two earlier studies that were promising. So I just yeah. thought I'd mention that. And remember, okay. our stroke patients got worse when we did both sides of the head. So, you know, those are parallel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Terrific. Um, Another question, um, what device is being used to measure cerebral blood flow? Well, of course, the spec scan I showed you from the HIPSCAN and his colleagues study, um, that, that's a published paper. And um, it was in 2019 on photo biomodulation, photomedicine, laser surgery. Okay, and, yeah. And um, it's in my profile page, for this talk where I give an abstract and I have a bibliography mentioning all these studies. You can get the references, the DOI notice yes. off of that. Okay. Um, so, and then our MRI imaging certainly shows that with the yes. stroke patients, no question about it. 